So when you're talking about our generation, you have more people who are pro-life and you have more people who are non-religious. And so where does that leave us? There's increasing amounts of secular pro-lifers. People that do not necessarily believe in God at all and think that there's a problem with abortion. I have a friend who said once that finding a secular pro-lifer is like finding a white tiger. There's not very many of them. And so when we find any, we get very excited and we ask us a picture to prove that we really do exist. Proof. Proof, yeah. That's Ellen right there. Yeah. So, um, so we're trying to create a space for secular pro-lifers. So one of the big reasons to understand secular arguments against abortion is to be able to talk to this growing demographic. If we want the pro-life movement not just to survive, but to grow, we need to be able to talk to non-traditional pro-lifers. I think we have pretty well down what you want to say to fellow Catholics and even to fellow Protestants, but what do you say to someone who doesn't believe in a soul? You can't argue soul begins at conception. They don't believe in a soul. They don't care. So you need to be able to talk to them in ways that make sense to them, in ways they care about. That's the first big reason to, to be able to speak about abortion in secular terms. And this is the second big reason. This is just, I call this the sideshow. No to women hating Christian fascist theocracy. Life begins when you stand up to Christian fascists. Keep your punish me, punishing, judgmental, fear-based God to yourself. Not the church, not the state. Women will decide their faith. Classic. Keep your rosaries off my ovaries. And the religious oppression of women. And look at, look at this. Surgeon General's warning. Exposure to secondhand religion may result in your child being molested by a priest, unwanted pregnancy, belief in omnipotent sky fairies, and death by stoning. So pause for a second and explain to me why, at an anti-abortion rally, are we talking about death by stoning? Okay? The second big reason to be able to explain anti-abortion positions in secular terms is so that we can skip this. I have seen so many abortion debates devolve into conversations about whether the Founding Fathers were religious, or what we think of church and state, or whether the Bible really says a soul starts at conception. And you might think those are interesting conversations, and you might want to have those conversations, which is fine. But in terms of abortion, they're irrelevant. They're totally irrelevant. And frankly, when we focus on a religious perspective for being pro-life, we play right into this. I will not say that every pro-choicer wants to do this. I have some pretty good friends who are pro-choice who understand a more nuanced version of the debate, but most of the pro-choicers I talk to prefer to talk about religion. In fact, they prefer it so much that they accuse me of being secretly religious. They think I am secretly a Christian, and if no one has anyone here, I'm not. <laughs> so we, we, for example, Secular for Life, went to an atheist convention to, to, to table at an atheist convention, and we got a huge backlash for that. And we had bloggers talking about how we're not really secular. They had no reason for saying that, except for the fact that we're pro-life. They assume because we're pro-life, we must be religious. And I propose that they do this because it's easier to talk about this, to talk about defending ourselves against religious oppression and patriarchy than to talk about human rights, which is what I want to talk about. So, and, and we've had countless Catholic and Protestant pro-lifers come up to us and say that they try to use secular arguments, and it doesn't matter what they say, because as soon as the person finds out that they're Christian, they're done. Because they don't have to think about it if they can just assume that it's just religious whatever, and they're not into that religion, so they don't have to talk to you, right? So there's two big reasons that we say it's good to be able to use secular arguments. The first one is to make seculars feel included. And the second one is to skip this. Okay? This is not helpful. So if you're going to use the secular arguments, what are they? And I'm not going to pretend that every single secular pro-lifer thinks the same thing. This is where our group comes from. I'm going to talk about four basic premises that we think put together mean that you should be pro-life even if you're secular, okay? So, and, and, and you may have heard a lot of this before, and if so, then I apologize, but I'm just gonna start from the beginning and go from there. The first premise is that the fetus is a human being. Now, when I say this, a lot of people get frustrated because they think I'm trying to do this sort of bait and switch, okay? They think I'm trying to say human being but really means something more than I mean. In, for this premise, for the first premise, literally all I mean is the biological understanding of a human being. That is, an organism that is a member of the human species. At this point, I am not 
I'm not asserting anything else. And some people think it's silly to bring that up, but you'd be surprised at how many people won't even grant you that. And it's not something to grant. It's just a fact. If we can't agree on that, we're not going to get very far. So we posted this on our Facebook page, I don't know, a week or two ago. Life begins at conception. This is not a religious belief. This is a fact of biology. As organisms, we begin as zygotes. You wouldn't believe how many people tell me that proves I'm religious, that I recognize that we begin as zygotes, okay? I can't even get past that. So, sorry to really, like, reiterate this, but I'm going to. Now, I chose dictionary.com to show how ubiquitous this understanding should be. It's got to be like, what, the first thing you go to when you don't know what something means? And it says a human being is an individual of the genus Homo, especially a member of the species Homo sapiens. Fertilization is the fusion of the haploid sperm and the haploid ovum, the egg cell, to form a single diploid cell called the zygote. The fertilized ovum, the zygote, is now metabolically activated and stimulated to start development. Biologically speaking, fertilization or conception is the beginning of human development. The zygote formed by the union of an oocyte, the egg cell, and a sperm is the beginning of a new human being. These are not pro-life sources, okay? These are biology textbooks, embryology textbooks, and general pregnancy resource websites, okay? This has nothing to do with the abortion debate. This is just a basic fact of biology that hopefully most of us learned in high school or earlier, and I, I'm just trying to establish this as the starting point. We do have situations where people won't even grant this, okay? And in that case, you just kind of have to move on. But in the beginning, this is what you start with. The fetus is biologically a human being. That's not the same thing as saying the fetus is a person. That's a philosophical thing. And I'm going to get to that right now. But first, I made this. Actually, I made this for, for Ellen because she debates abortion all the time. And this is what will happen. We'll say, the fetus is a human organism, and they'll say, well, my skin cells are human, and you don't care about them. And you're like, yeah, because your skin cells aren't organisms. And then they'll say, well, bacteria are organisms, you don't care about that. And you're like, yeah, because they're not human organisms. And then on it goes. So, human yeah. organism, the phrase, both of those words matter, okay? We are interested in the biological human being. And people will try to take you in one direction or the other over and over and over again. So sometimes you just have to, like, simplify. Okay. With pictures. Yeah, with pictures. So, <laughs> the second part. So we said the fetus is a human being. The second premise, and this is, I think, where most of the debate usually ends up centering, at least for now, is the difference between human being and person. And secular pro-life proposes that there's no consistent objective distinction between human being and person. Okay, so this is a bumper sticker that we sell that kind of gets to that idea person, a human being who can live independently of others, or a human being who is conscious, or a human being who is wanted, that's one of the worst ones, or just a human being. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on this because I feel like this comes up a lot. So what do people say when they talk about person? These are the three main things that we see. Viability, self-awareness, or they might say consciousness, or some cognitive function and level of development in other ways besides cognition, like heartbeat and things like that. And these pictures are examples of different things different people will say is what qualifies you for personhood. And I'd point out that right off the bat, it seems like there's kind of a problem if the general population can't agree on what person means. They're just sure that it's not a fetus, though, but it, it's something else. So um, you have whether or not you have human DNA. That's kind of our thing. And then you have brainwaves or self-awareness or consciousness or ability to feel pain, viability. The top left one, relationships. This one is not as common, but every now and then I do see people say that you aren't a person until you are a member of society in the sense that you have meaningful relationships with other people. And I am not going to talk about that beyond this slide because it's ridiculous. It's still <laughs> illegal to kill hermits. Like the idea that your innate value depends on how many friends you have is a terrible idea. And I think that's why we don't see it, thankfully, very often. I just kind of threw it in there because people sometimes do say that. There's no separate slides on that one. But I am going to go through the other stuff a little bit more slowly. So viability. For those of you who don't already know, this is when the fetus is developed enough that if the fetus were born, he or she would live independent of the woman. And some people say you're not a person unless you can live physically independent. But I think this is sort of a, a backwards looking view. I think most people use this, not necessarily on purpose, but most people use this as a way, they're trying to think, how can I justify abortion? So I'll use this definition. Instead of thinking, 
what defines a person, does abortion make sense? So they're kind of moving backwards through the, the thought process. Because if you think about this for a little bit longer, this, this, I think this definition is actually one of the most common ones I see and it makes no sense at all. So this is Amelia Taylor. She, I think, still currently holds the world record for most premature baby to survive. She was born at 21 weeks and six days. And they know the exact date because she was conceived through in vitro fertilization. And the idea that she's a person because she survived, so she was viable, kind of breaks apart when you think about how one of the reasons she survives is because she was born in Florida, where we have the medical technology to help extremely premature babies. If she had been born in a third world developing country without that medical technology, she would have been the same baby girl, the exact same entity, and she would not have survived. So by this idea of viability equaling personhood, that means that she's a person if her mom gives birth in Florida and not a person if she's in a third world developing country. And I just think that person who can't depend on geography, that seems like also a very bad idea. And I'm not the only one who's, who's noticed that that's a little bit of an issue. So this comes from a journal of early pregnancy talking about when, uh, what the earliest stages of viability are. And they say there is at the present time no worldwide uniform gestational age that defines viability. Because viability is not an intrinsic property of the fetus, because viability should be understood in terms of both biological and technological <coughs> factors. So I propose that whatever personhood means, it must be intrinsic to the entity you're talking about. It can't depend on things like this. You shouldn't be able to take that entity and they're a person in this context and not in that one. They're either a person or they're not, right? Which is why we don't accept the idea that viability equals personhood. <coughs> 